Well, good morning, Avenue Church. It is good to be with you. It is good to have already worshiped with you. My name is Casey. I get to serve as one of the pastors here, and uh, it's a joy to be in the presence of the Lord with people that I love just like you. And so there's a great vibe among us. If you don't know what that is, it's more than just good music and awesome iced coffee. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and and continue our time together in worship as we turn to God's Word and, and we begin a new series that we're we're, we're super excited about. So let me pray, and we'll, we'll hop in. Father, thank you so much for this time, Lord. Thank you uh, for who you are, and we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would keep our eyes fixed on you, our hearts captivated by you, and that you would draw men and women, boys and girls, all people to your name, Jesus. You can do this. You can do this. We trust you. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, before we kick it off, uh, just two quick things that we want to celebrate and also let you know about July 29th, which is next week, we have our onboarding class, okay? We're going to start onboarding again, and this is an opportunity for you guys to uh, hop into the life of the church. If you're thinking about joining the church and kind of becoming a covenant member and saying, hey, this is where we're going to do family life, this is the the journey for you. Uh, We'd love for you guys to partake in this. It's going to be a few weeks after service. It'll be about an hour every Sunday, and we meet right after service. We talk to you a little bit about our philosophy, uh, how the gospel changes things. You get to hear from different voices in the church. So it's informational, but it's also equipping as to how you can really thrive here um, at the Avenue Church. And another thing, which is, uh, it's not an announcement, it's just kind of like a uh, awesome. We had some baptisms today. Is there anybody with us this morning that we got to baptize? Could you just slip up your hand real quick? No, okay. So I said that to, to get it started, but what I really want Could you stand up if you were baptized yesterday? And we just want to love on you. Can we give it up for these guys? Look around. So awesome. So awesome. Welcome to the family. And uh, like we said yesterday, it was it was kind of like your your marriage ceremony that says, I now belong to another. Uh, and so it was awesome. It was awesome to see that. We got to baptize about 10 people, and uh, it was just a really cool moment for the, for the family to be together. So um, you don't want to miss our next baptism. Come on out and support that. Hey, so we're going to start a new series, and it's called What About? Six Questions That Deserve Attention. Now, I was careful in the wording to not put an answer as though we were going to be able to fully answer these six questions because they're really big. They're, they're kind of heavy. They're, um, they're, they're really meaningful to us because they come from research uh, that was done primarily focused on millennials and why millennials are not in church, why they either have left church or why they're not in church. And what we're saying is, if this is true of millennials, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this information to spark us into a series that we believe is probably true for all age demographics. Like, like these are six areas that most likely keep people away from church, keep people away from God, keep people away from the things of the Lord. And so what we wanna do is venture out, this is kinda new for us, this is like a, you know, uh, this is not how we normally do things, but we say, hey, let's, let's try this, and, and we're going to be here for a few weeks, and we're going to be exploring some different topics that have been um, maybe uh, an obstacle to why people are no longer pursuing their faith or why they never began to pursue their faith. So for us, this is our, um, a, a step towards reimagining evangelism. Okay, and so what, here's, here's how it's going to work. So over the weeks, um, what you'll see is if you, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see the order, I believe, of like when these weeks are coming. And, and you can look at topics that you think might be pertinent to somebody who has like kind of turned them, their, themselves off to church. And you could do like a strategic invite. And you'd be like, oh, this is a person who thinks that you have to check your brain at the door when it comes to scientific issues. I'm going to invite them to the week where you explore what about God and science. Or maybe, maybe it's somebody who struggles with their sexuality or, or, or just sex in general or they, they feel as though the church has, has like missed that. And, and so we're going to handle what about God and sex? That would be a week to invite them to that. And what about doubt? We, we've seen from the research that, that people say that there's not a safe place in the church to have legitimate doubt. And when they did, they were given like a pat answer and told like that will be enough. Just believe that. 
And so they're like, I'm out of here. Like it's, it's, it's like a shallow uh, valuing of who I am. So we're going to be handling what about God and doubt. We're going to be handling what about God and money. As you know, you probably have friends who are like, man, the church just wants my money. The church is all about trying. We're going to handle that. We're going to address that. Today we're talking about what about God and culture and, and how is it that we enter into culture in a really significant and loving way? Because the research would say that, um, I forget the actual number, I have it up over there in my notes, I think it's like a quarter of millennials believe that the church demonizes everything they love. So if you love Fortnite, if you love Netflix, if you love fill in the blank, if you love Drake, if you love this, if you love that, there, the thought is that the church is like anti-everything that doesn't have a Christian label on it, and so I'm out. Like the church actually just wants to take all my goods and, and, and leave me with nothing. And we're going to kind of address, well, how does the church enter into, what does God think about culture? What, what does his word have to say about how we enter into that and, and actually uh, engage with that in a, in a relevant and, and loving way. Next week, we're going to talk about what about God and meaning, and we're, we're actually going to do a bit of a deeper dive. Before we get to meaning, we're going to, we're, we're going to do a dive on, like, is the Bible a legit source to look for meaning? Like, is it, is it a legitimate accumulation of books, or was it just kind of randomly put together by some guys who decided to write some stuff? So we're going to look at some of the authenticity of the Bible. So if you've got somebody who's like, man, like, you're, you always reference the Bible, but how could you say that? It's just a book that was... What, we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to, we're going to kind of walk through some of that and do some historical, uh, historical uh, evidence type stuff. And so, anyways, um, we're really excited about this series. We want you to be able to use this um, in two ways. Number one, to be able to invite maybe people who've kind of stayed away from church. And again, when you invite somebody, be, understand that we're, we're not bringing them in so that we can hurt them. That's why I said we're going to give attention to these issues, not come down with like a, hey, here's the answer. We want, to, we want to give attention. We want to give value to the fact that these are some of the issues that have pushed people away. So let's enter into that. And the second thing we thought it would do is it would equip you, because we realize not all your friends who aren't down with the faith thing are going to come to church. We're believing it's actually going to equip you to have really rich and meaningful conversations when you leave here based on what we teach throughout Scripture. Okay? Because you're really the ones who are going to engage with these people, not, not just a, a message on a Sunday. And so we're, we're super excited about that. Um, a couple of uh, things that will kind of be foundational for us in the midst of this series. Uh, let me just mention some of those. Uh, the first one is, is this. Um, we have this desire to not only value some of that, some of that uh, pushback that the church has received, but also um, equip us to be sent out and engage in, in, in a loving way, just like I said. And, and why is that important? Why is that important to us? Check out some of these numbers. Um, six and ten. Six and ten. Let's just start with that one. Uh, the, the, the research called it, or the article that I was reading called it, The Young Exodus the young exodus, that there is a young exodus happening right now in our church. And what that number signifies is that six out of ten of our young people are leaving the church, like, like when they have the opportunity. Okay, so if you've got like a six-year-old, probably doesn't have the opportunity to hang out at home. Okay, but as soon as, as, soon as uh, somebody maybe comes of age, 15, 17, 20, college, whatever the case may be, six out of ten, I'm not talking about of people who are being raised in, in like, non-Christian homes. I'm talking about our people are leaving. And so, you know, I think the word, the, the term young exodus is a really viable description of what's happening. Like, it made me pay attention. And, and what makes me always pay attention more than numbers is names. So I just wanted to give you, um, give you a few names and then ask you to do something with those names. Cade, Axel, Cora, Addison, Gunner, Caleb, Sabi, Sofa, Micah, and Aria. Which six of those are you willing to give up? We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to enter in. We got to equip ourselves. We have to go where our people already are if we want to rewrite a different narrative. It's not just the 60%, though, it's also the 3%, or in, in the number that we have here, the 97% in South Florida. We'll call them the, the forgotten majority. Uh, again, research would say that about 3% of people are born-again, Jesus-loving, uh, Jesus-following believers. 
Like 3% of our population in South Florida, so just think about that for a second. So Delray is made up of about 66,000 people. 3% of the South Florida population follows Jesus. So there's a 97% rate of people who are saying no to the things of the Lord. So it's not just the young exodus. This is far bigger than just our youth. This is all ages and demographics, for the most part, who are saying, you know, I hear about your Jesus, and, and my answer is no thank you. Maybe they've never heard about the Jesus of the Bible. Maybe they have, and they've, they've experienced some of, those, some of those six reasons as to why they're not, you know, a part of a living faith right now. I don't, I don't know, but what I do know is that if, if you were to look into my heart, oftentimes that is the forgotten majority. Like, I don't always have a heart that beats for the lost. I don't always have a heart that beats for people who have to, like, manufacture their hope that have to prove themselves over and over and over. I don't always have a heart for people who, who have this world as like their greatest treasure. Like I forget about them. And so what we, what we wanna do over these next couple of weeks and over the life of the church really is never forget about the forgotten majority. Like we wanna be a place that enters into exactly where they are and we begin to value and listen and hear and then invite them to that better story that only Jesus can provide. And so uh, that's what this series is all about. So we're just asking for prayer. Um, we're gonna be getting a new thing with uh, a few other local churches here in Delray. The first Wednesday of every month, so it'll be coming up here in August, the first Wednesday of every month, we're gonna ask that our church fast and pray. And, and uh, this particular first Wednesday, we're going to be fasting and praying for these people that you see up here on the screen. And then actually that Wednesday night, we're going to have uh, some praise and worship over at Trinity in Delray with some of these other local churches where we just get together and we, we worship Jesus and, uh, and we kind of just come together as, as one church who's on mission uh, as a family. So the first Wednesday of every month, we're going to be uh, asking for intentional uh, fasting and prayer over this. We'll be joining uh, the church. It's a church united kind of gathering type thing, and so we're really excited to, uh, to be doing that. And so um, as we kind of get ready to enter into this particular topic, these are some things that you know, you should be thinking about. Valuing people where they are, being able to engage them, uh, hopefully maybe receiving some further equipping than you've had uh, in the past over some of these topics and, and, and being prayerful, prayerful over that. So, hey, let's just go ahead and hop in. We're going to be taking a look at God and culture, God and culture. So I'm going to move over here. We'll be using some of the screens. So uh, you have an outline that hopefully you'll be able to uh, follow along uh, if, if you get lost. And um, it'll be something also that you can take home and maybe it'll even help you as, as we pray and, and do those sort of things uh, together. So what about um, God and culture? One-fourth of 18 to 29-year-olds believe the church demonizes things that define their culture. They believe that it's like an isolated thing, almost like the church versus um, the world. And so uh, let's, let's do a little bit of theology, okay? That's where we always want to start. We don't want to start you know, with my idea or this philosophy. Let's start with what, so the word theology means the study of God. So let's do the study of God as it pertains to culture. Now let me just preface this with a couple things. Um, you could be on this topic for a year or years, okay? It's a, it's a, you could do years on every one of these topics. So we're going to do our best to handle them, give you guys some resources so that not only you'll be equipped now, but you'll also be equipped to, to do a little homework uh, on your own. Every week after this message, I'm going to do a 10-minute recap, and we're going to um, have that on our website uh, or, or our app under sermons. So if you have a friend that you think wouldn't listen to this longer version of the message, but they might give it like a TED Talk version, you'll have that available to you as well. So we're going we're gonna to do that uh, as well. And so um, just so you guys know, those are some of the tools, but we always want to start with a theology of, of culture. So what does God have to say about culture. Well, um, first, let's, let's get our understanding correct about God as it pertains to culture. It's first understanding that God is the creator of culture. So uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Uh, it, we'll have some of these verses on the screens as well. But we can see in Genesis 1, 1, uh, this is how it all begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's important for us to realize that God has not separated himself from culture. God is actually the creator of culture. He is the creator, because if you define culture, you can flesh it out to like music, uh, movies, language, food, um, different types of like spirituality, okay? So God is the, the, the ultimate creator and originator of that. 
Now that doesn't mean that when you see parts of that culture that have been broken and tainted and, and abused, that he's a part of that. But he's a part of the beginning of that culture. He also sustains it and he's sovereign over it. But we don't attach God to the way that people have mis misused culture. And we'll, we'll flesh that out here in, in just a minute. But it's important for us to start with this idea that God is a creator of culture. He's the creator of all these things. So he gave us these things that we now call um, culture. And he, he, he said something about his creation. In uh, Genesis 1:31, 31, uh, when he had, he had finished, he got to day six, he looked at his creation and he's like, man, God saw everything he made and behold, it was very good. It was very good. Have you ever done a manual labor job Usually it's manual labor because you can see the effects of it, like you painted a room or something like that, and you stand back and you're like, dang, that's, that's good. That's good work. Sometimes you, sometimes you like finish it and you're like, I hope the person paying me doesn't see it. You know, I hope I just get paid and I can move on. But sometimes you're like, man, that, that was good. Okay, so God looks at his work and he's like, man, that was, that was so good. He's like, um, he, he delights in his work. Not only is he the creator and the sustainer, but he also delights in what he gave to us as creation. He said that it was very good. But then he also, he gives us a role in that creation, right? So God doesn't create things and then just back away and, and um, say, hey, you know, like, I hope it works out for you. Um, nor does he say, hey, you guys are going to, you know, you're going to have a role in this and, and completely separate himself from that either. It's actually a partnership that God enters into as it pertains to culture. He's the creator, but then he gives us the opportunity to to play. He takes us off the bench and puts us in the game. He gives us an incredibly significant role as it pertains to his creation and culture. We see it here in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Check this out. So God created man in his own image, which is really important because when you understand our role in creation, you're going to begin to understand more and more that as you faithfully fulfill what God has asked us to do as it pertains to culture, you are showing the world who God is because we've been made in his image. So in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so this is God, the account of God creating us, but then he's going to commission us. He's going to give us a job. Uh, next verse, 28. And God blessed them. Okay, so God, um, again, he doesn't just say, good luck with this. He, he actually gives, the, the best way that God can bless people is by giving them himself. So he gives them himself. This is Adam and Eve. And he's like, here, I'm going to bless you, and then I'm going to commission you. I'm going to give you a job. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, now, so we could do different sorts of word studies on a lot of these, uh, you know, commands, and, and, and let, let's just take a look at a few of these words so you get the, the pertinent idea of what God was telling his people. So you see the fruitful and multiply, so like we're to fill the earth, like, like having babies, we're, we're the ones that are, that are to populate the earth, and, and we're, we're supposed to not just populate the earth for population's sake, although we, like, that's an awesome thing. God loves sex. He loves to give it to us. He loves the enjoyment of it, but there's also a purpose to it. And so here he talks about the purpose, and he says um, it's to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and the sea, and he goes on to name a couple of other things of, of his creation. And so you see this idea of, of subduing and dominion. And, and it's not like we might think of these words as, okay, well, this means that I have power to do what I want. When you hear, when you hear the word subdue and dominion, sometimes you would think, well, I don't want to be subdued. I don't want anyone to have dominion over me. We have democracy. So these aren't negative uses of the word. If you look at the fullness of the meaning of each of these words, there's, there's, there's two themes that come out of this. There's two important themes that come out of this. Now, this is called the cultural mandate. It's a term that, that we've used throughout the church for years and years and years. And the two themes that come out of the cultural mandate, what God wants us to do in culture, you can see it right here, stewardship and creativity. You got some blanks on your outline. If you're a writer, write these down. If not, take a picture. If not, just hang with me. That's cool. Everybody, no, no judgment here. You're welcome. Stewardship and creativity. The cultural mandate, what God wants us to do in culture is he wants us to care for it, 
stewardship, dominion. He wants us, he wants us to care for it, he wants us to enter into it, not be separate from it, engage in it. He wants us to get our hands dirty. Remember now, now the, the setting for this is a garden. So uh, I'm not much of a gardener, okay? That's not really a thing with me. But what I do know about gardens, I know that Janice has a crew and she takes care of a garden and I know some of you are like Bob Lane into gardens. Here's what I know about, if you're a real gardener, that means there's probably after you've gardened, you probably have dirt under your fingernails. Your hands probably need to be washed. Your knees are probably a little bit messy. If you're actually going to care for something, that means you have to touch it and get dirty with it. It means that you have to be with what you're caring for. Much like right now, my little guys who are sick, so they're not in AC Kids, but if they were in AC Kids, I'm not caring for them way over here. Somebody else is. And when I actually start caring for them and, and providing stewardship over them is when I get near them and I get in very close proximity to them. The other side of this cultural mandate is creativity. That, that we, in a garden, remember that, remember that scene, in a garden, as you care for things, as you're a good steward over things, make sure they get the water they need, the, the shade, the sunlight, all those sorts of things, as you care for the garden, new things are gonna grow. Things that weren't there because of your consistent care are going to sprout up. Now listen, it's not like you're the creator because, because God created out of nothing and, and he then gave us the raw elements. So what we're doing is we're like rearranging, we're reorienting the raw elements that God has given us, but because we're in his image, we're actually telling the story of what God did before us as we bring new things to life. So we care for and we create. That's, that's our call as it pertains to the culture. Influenced uh, this week, it kind of got me started by an article uh, from a guy named Jerry Solomon. Uh, and not that I agree with everything in the article, but, but I thought he had some really good points. That's, that's a resource if you want to jot that down. Um, he just, he wrote about, um, I can't remember the title of the author, but it was, it was, it was like um, uh, the gospel and culture. And I thought it had some, some really good thinking points to this. And, and this was one of the things that he was bringing out. It's like these two themes really are what we're called to do as it pertains to the culture, as it pertains to the world around us. We're supposed to, to uh, be involved. We're supposed to have our hands dirty. We're supposed to know it. We, we know the scent of it. We know how it feels. We've, we've been engaged. We've left where we were comfortable, and we engaged in the world around us, in the culture around us, and from our love and from our care and because we're made in God's image and because God has blessed us with his Holy Spirit, as we care and rearrange and have our hands dirty, we begin to see new things come to life. It was cool because uh, yesterday when we did the baptisms, we, like I said, we baptized about 10 people and then we always have um, people who support the people who are getting baptized and we give them an opportunity to share something about the people, man, I've seen this in you and I've seen this in you and, and, and the people who are not getting baptized but they're just there for support are like, oh man, it's just been so cool to see how like, the Lord has worked in your life and, and they share different encouraging things. And what I think is um, beautiful about that moment is that, that God in his sovereignty didn't have to use the supporting community to, to save the people that we baptized. He could have just done it on his own, but he chose to use our stewardship, our care, our love, our getting ourselves into the mess of somebody else's life to bring new things to life. Like, that's, that's what God's in the business of doing. That's our perspective as we engage culture, care, and looking for those new things to come to life. And now, um, as, as we kind of travel along this thought, we, we cannot forget that um, there's, there's been a brokenness. Because, you know, Genesis 2 is followed by Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, we see that um, there was a choice that humanity made, that although they were blessed and although they were, um, they, it seemed like they had at least probably some time of caring for and bringing new things to life. I mean, um, you, you see that uh, there was naming of the animals. If you're familiar with the Genesis account, the animals were brought, and, and I mean, God could have named the animals. He probably would have done better than giraffe, 
zebra, you know, like, I don't know, but like he gives that over to, he gives it over to humanity and we, we come up with those sort of things, ant eater and all those. So, so we're, we're naming, we're caring, we're creating things like that. We didn't make the animals, but we're, we're giving them names. Um, but, but somewhere along the line in Genesis 3 captures it, we decided to separate ourselves from God. We decided that um, God wasn't enough for us, that we appreciated his offer and that it worked for a while, but that we were going to find, when I say we, I mean all of humanity because I'm included in this. I, they're, just, they're just like part of my family line. We decided that we were going to separate ourselves from God. Now, we didn't, we didn't do it overtly, like, God, like, well, I don't want anything to do with you. We did it subtly. Like, we're still good, right? I just want to live out my own agenda. And uh, what happened was there was a, a, a separation that, resulted from our initial separation. Once we separated from God and rejected his love, rejected like him as the, the pinnacle of our life, there was a consequence to that. And the consequence was uh, separation. Like, like God in turn separated himself from our separation. God's like, man, I, I, we can't do this relationship the way we've done it anymore. I'm holy, I'm just, and I'm loving, and I have to bring a consequence to your rebellious heart that has said no thanks to me. And so, and so the consequence was death. And we see this in, in, in the early account of Genesis that, that God said, you're, you're going to die. And they died spiritually, so God, he had to separate himself from that impurity and that unrighteousness or would have compromised who God was. Uh, they were going to die uh, physically, so now what God had set in course, the cultural mandate was supposed to be a forever lifetime job for them. What happened is they now had expiration dates on their life. They would get old and they would die as a consequence to their initial separation from God. And then one day they would be eternally separated from God. Like, like God would say, hey, the, the ultimate consequence to your rebellious heart is that my wrath comes upon those who not only reject me, but then selfishly pursue their own ways. Like, like I have to do that as righteous judge. That is the, that is the only response to your initial move. And, uh, and so we see that, that it left Adam and Eve, our original parents, in a really perilous situation. It left us in a really perilous situation. And, and so um, God decided to do something about that. He didn't leave us to now just kind of figure things out on our own. He would send a Messiah. He would send somebody named Jesus who would make it right, who would be the bearer of our sin and, and be able to rectify us because Jesus was punished for our sin and died our death, and on the third day was brought back from the dead. So God the Father, he took our sin, and he put it on Christ so that he could, he could make us right again. He could forgive us, and he could bring us back into that blessed state with him, and we could get back to the cultural mandate under his blessing and under his power. But we do need to be very aware that because of Genesis 3, there is a brokenness that our culture now exists in, that has not been removed. Although when you come to faith in Christ and you trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, you surrender yourself to him, you begin to be renewed, your shame is removed, your brokenness is removed, and God begins this really cool work in you. What we have to understand is the world around us is waiting for Jesus to come back and do that holistically. And so although now we're operating under this new power and this newness in Christ, the world operates still in, under this curse. And so when we go back and engage in the world, we have to understand that our culture has a brokenness to it. And, and let me be clear, we still have a brokenness to us as well that the Lord is working out, but, but the world does as well. And so you know kind of how, um, like, if you've been a Christian for a while and you start to see, hey, man, th this is what my life should look like, and you're struggling to see it look like that, it can be frustrating at times, whether it's with sex or lust or, or, or your gossip or selfishness, whatever it might be. You're, you're just a lover of comfort. You know, sometimes, like, you follow Jesus long enough, and he will graciously reveal to you, hey, there's a gospel gap in your life, and it frustrates you. But the, but the hope of the gospel is that God may never fully close that gap on this side, but, like, he's renewing all things. He's closing it more and more, and one day he will close it completely. The same is true of creation, there are gospel gaps all throughout creation. It's why we see God's good created order turn into things that were abused. So the separation that we see in Genesis 3, it led to Adam and Eve and Casey and Catherine and Travis and Emily and Shane 
all having to work through abusing the cultural mandate they were given. You see, Adam and Eve, because they separated from God, they then abused what they were supposed to do. And it was passed on to me and to you. And so now when you look at our world today, you, th- you see things like racism. You see things like poverty. You see things like human trafficking. Because when we live in a world that has separated itself from God, that he has not fully redeemed yet, there's still a brokenness that we're called to enter into and begin to create new things in. And so as we kind of think through, okay, so I understand I have a job, care, and, and uh, create, and I understand that I'm going to do that in a world that is yet to be redeemed, in a world that has abused that responsibility, and there's been like horrific things that have happened because of it. Um, wh- what, do, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, I love this slide. Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Um, let's just sit here for a second, because when you understand that Jesus not only came to redeem you, but he came to redeem culture, it starts to make your faith journey way bigger than just you. So when Christ died and rose again and promised that he would come back, he not only created a way for you to be made right with God, for you to have harmony again with God through faith in his finished work, he also created the path for God to renew all things. So his death and resurrection, it has your name on it, but it also has cosmic consequences. Like it's, it's a significant part in God renewing all things. Because when Jesus overcame death, that was, the, that was the signal that he would come back and overcome the brokenness in which we now live. And so the cultural mandate, it still remains. It's still on us. We're still called to care and create new things in culture, even though it's broken. The question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? Um, next slide gives us a couple of different ways uh, that, that people have, have put out throughout history. This guy, Richard um, Neighbor, he's got this uh, work called Christ and Culture. And he's got a couple of different ways of looking at how people have engaged Jesus and culture over the years. And, and so some people have taken a philosophy of Christ against culture. And, and that's kind of like, okay, Jesus is over here, culture is over here, uh, and, and the two don't mix. They're actually at war with one another. Now, some people have taken the, the, the case of Christ of culture, Christ of culture, and this is almost like where they try to synchronize Jesus with culture. So they'll, they'll try to say like, okay, I'm just going to try, I'm going to take Jesus into culture, but I'm going to allow Jesus to be lost in the mix. And, and just let the culture define who Jesus is. And so you lose things like absolute truth. You lose things like um, right and wrong because Jesus just gets to be defined by culture. Um, some people have taken the, the, the cause of Christ above culture. So this, this kind of has like a top down looking at like, so like we, we know best, almost kind of like domineering perspective. Um, Christ and culture. So in, in the midst of like, thinking through Christ and culture, um, I, I, I don't remember what this was about. I was looking at my notes, my Christ and culture. I don't remember what this one was about. It was like, okay, I know it's not against, I know it's not of, I know it's not above, but that would be something for you guys to look up if you want to look up this, this article that I was reading by Jerry Solomon. Christ and culture is, is kind of like a, um, I, I could make something up right now, but I won't. Is that cool? All right, I'm just going to go to the one that I know we're going to camp out on. I'm sure John O'Brien knows what it is. I'm almost tempted to be like, John, what's Christ and culture? John, do you know? Joy's hitting you. Do you know what Christ and culture means? Yeah, that, that like second to last word. <laughs> Could you give us like a 10 second stand up explanation of it? That's so good. Thank you. So some people, by the way, this is how we do church at the Avenue. Okay, so thank you. Um, so they don't really mix. So it's not like it's against culture. It's just like I'm going to do my thing over here. Culture's going to do its thing over here, and, and that's just, that's okay. The last one that we're going to focus on is, is Christ transforms culture. Yes? Yes.
Yeah, so hopefully as we go through, I'll be able to, to touch on that. Good, good question, though. It's like, so why is this pushing people away from church? Thank you. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, which is one of the things that we want to do, is if you have questions, we're going to do a big Q&A panel at the end. Uh, it's going to be on a Wednesday night. So send your questions to info at, the, at theavchurch.com, and we want to handle all of your questions. But thank you for that question. So I'm sure you're going to have questions as we walk through this. So Christ transforms culture. Um, as you can see, probably, and this to, to a degree will we'll touch on your question, if you have a Christ against culture, um, most people, let me rephrase that, all people live in culture. So if your Christ is like against where people live, that's going to be pretty, um, um, not only disconcerting, but it's going to be a pretty big turnoff to people. If you're bringing a Christ that is against everything in culture, then people are going to be like, well, what is Christ for? I mean, we, we, we are probably familiar with some of the Christ against culture. It would be uh, usually angry, um, trying to make a statement, and, and it's, it's pretty aggressive. And when, when we look at the Christ of the Bible, we see a very bold but loving Christ who you get to know what he's for a lot more than you get to know what he's against. Not that he's not against certain sinful behaviors, things like that. It's just that he leads with what he's for. Um, when, when you see Christ transforms, this is kind of where, where the church needs to push as we look at scriptures. Christ transforms culture. So, so what would that potentially look like? So again, um, as, as, you, as you look into your scriptures, we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 5. And, and Matthew chapter 5 gives us our, our walking orders, uh, if you will. It's, it's the salt and light uh, passage, and, and it's where Jesus uh, begins to talk about what it means uh, to be salt and light. And here's what, here's what he says in Matthew 5. He's like, listen, um, you are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. And the inference is that because you are those things in Christ, you are to not only begin to be agents of change, but you must be with the culture to do that. Christ transforms culture. I want to give you a, a, a little bit of a caveat here as we start talking about Christ transforming culture. We have to be careful not to go out arrogant. We have to be careful not to go out thinking that uh, we are going to enter into a cultural moment and win it. I want, to, I want to be careful and stay away from that language because I believe that has been what has pushed many people away is the fact that they feel like um, they're, they're being domineered or they're, they're being sold something almost. So we have to be careful. When we, when we talk about Christ transforms culture, which is, it is our call to care and create. That's how we transform culture. We have to remember that we go in humble, that we go in with hearts that are for people and willing to be with people walking alongside them in the long journey of change, not looking for that immediate win, whatever that might be. So Jesus and, Ma and, and Matthew says that, that we are the, the salt and, and the light of the world. And um, th I love this, this passage because it reminds us who we are. He doesn't say to get salty. Actually, in the midst of this passage, he says to be careful not to lose your saltiness. And so you are salt. If you are a believer in Christ, if you've come to a place of faith in Christ, you are salt. You are a light in the world. Now the question is, are you willing to like be salty? Are, are you willing to be who you are? Because I think one of, the, one of the quickest ways you can lose your saltiness is to stay in the salt shaker around other salts. Admiring the form and shape and, and way that other salt looks. Salt was meant to be poured out. Salt was meant to go from where it is contained to then bring flavor, taste, change, and healing to the world around it. So the encouragement from Jesus is, is to like, get salty. Herbert Sloshberg says that he's a social commentator. He says the salt of people changed by the gospel must change the world. 
So we don't go out with this heavy-handed agenda. We go out and we begin to realize that we already are salt. We just need to make sure that we find ourselves in the right place with the right agenda. The agenda is not that, that, that like we, we are uh, holding this banner of like we win, you lose. The agenda is loving God and loving people and using discernment as you read the situation and invite people relations, relationally more and more and more to the person of Jesus. It would require what Tim Keller calls is a faithful presence. So the question for us as a church is, are we willing to be faithfully present in the culture around us? Are we willing um, to show up, again, not with this grandiose agenda that says we're above and we win, uh, but also not with this like, well, it's, it's just whatever, it doesn't really matter. No, no, no. Are we willing, because we are the salt of the world, because the Holy Spirit has filled believers, are we willing to take that filling of the Holy Spirit and lovingly be with people and engage and enter into their world and garden as we see new things brought to life? That's, that's how we begin to be transformers of the culture. That's how we begin to see this new city that, that Jesus promises is coming become more and more a reality. Hey, I just want to finish up our time here with, with, with this, this thought stream. The idea here is, is saltiness, if you will, or, or faithful presence. And, and, and I always like to ask the question, well, well how, do I, how do I be salty? How is it that I have a faithful presence in the midst of, of my culture. I think a few thoughts to send us away. The first one is enjoy. Be able to enjoy his good gifts. So you, you can't be salt and light without drawing near. Now the first person you draw near to is Jesus because he's the one who makes you salt. He's the one who makes you light. So abiding in his word, abiding with him in prayer, abiding with his people, that's what gives you your saltiness. But then, at the same time, you have to draw near to culture. If we're going to be a faithful presence in culture, if we're going to be salt that was meant to be poured out, we have to be in the places that we're supposed to be. You have to be coaching your kid. You have to be at work. You have to be in the gym. You have to be at this restaurant. You have to be here. You have to, like, it's important and imperative that the salt go where it was meant to go. Faithfully, present, willing to walk alongside people love people. What does that look like? Well, I think, first of all, it looks like the freedom and the call to actually enjoy God's good creation. Like, God is the giver of all good things, and we receive them with thanksgiving. When we do that, we honor him. We glorify him. So we eat our food, and we, and, and we watch our movies, and we listen to our music, and we engage in our city and in our lives, and all. we do that with discernment, realizing there's broken pieces that going to be difficult and it might not be healthy for us. Understanding there's some boundaries there, but, but we first go in with this, this idea that like God has created this culture, these good things, that we might enjoy him in them. So our first move as Christians, our first move if we want to become a church that begins to engage culture in a way that doesn't drive people away but actually attracts people to the person of Jesus is to learn how to enjoy it a little bit more. How do we enjoy it responsibly, faithfully, in a way that is good for our hearts and leads us to Jesus, not in a way where we abuse it like we did in the garden? Well, secondly, it, it, it seems clear that in, enjoying things wouldn't be the, the only stop that we would need to engage in, in a way Maybe that's a little bit different than you're used to. I'm calling it here, engage in the margins. In, in our desire to see Jesus have a faithful presence in all of culture, it's not just about enjoying, it's also engaging in the margins. See, the world can enjoy culture, okay, and we can connect on that level, but we're actually not called to just be the world. We're called to enter into the world with this different narrative about us. And so where do we engage? We engage in the margins. We actually look to engage in culture where many people have forgotten it. So we look to the orphan. We look to the widow. We look to issues of racial brokenness. 
we, we look to abused power, we look to human trafficking, we look, we look in the margins where the world doesn't often want to look, and then we engage that with our hearts. We ask the Lord, God, give me something that would match your heart where I can engage my heart. We don't, it's not like you, you engage at the same level in every issue, but you ask the Lord to put like one or two things on your heart that you can engage with deeply. And then finally, you empty yourself. You empty yourself regularly for where God has placed you. You look at your world, you look at your surroundings, you look at the culture that God has given you. And you begin to think that I am the pastor of this space. I'm the gardener. I'm the one that God has called and filled with his spirit to care for and create and see new things brought to life. And as you do that, you start to see things like, like City House come out of nowhere. You start to see City House is a, is a, is a, a residency journey for single moms here that, that just came out of a few people who had a desire to care for and see something new be brought to life. You see things like G2I Design, which is a, 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 a company owned by Gabe, and, and it's got an employee here in the church as well, that, and their, their desire is to bring the gospel to the internet. It's not an overt Christian company. It doesn't have stickers and fish and crosses. It just has spirit-filled believers who do really awesome work and then are intentional about giving their, their, some of their profits to, to the street boys in Kenya. You start to see things like Wells Roast come up, which is uh, just led by a guy who used to work for the church and felt like God was calling him into like the coffee industry. And he does it in a way where he understands the kingdom of God is actually coming through him by the way he cares for and creates new things. I was thinking, you know, some people might think, well, you know, as it pertains to like being somebody who cares for and and creates new life within their culture. That sounds like it might, maybe it's for the hipsters in Portland and, and like maybe the people in New York City. And, but you know who God put on my heart this morning who it's for? I, it's for everyone, but I think, I, I don't know if you just needed to hear this or not. I think it's for the, the, the moms who are at home with their kids right now. I want you to hear this. If you want to think about somebody who cares for, gets their hands dirty, gives themselves regularly to the good of another so that new things can come to life all the way down the stream. Man, those are some people who are creating, sustaining, beautifying culture. You need to hear that, be encouraged in that. Wherever you are, whoever you are, the call is to care for and create trusting the spirit if you'll just continue to show up faithfully to make new things. I'm going to ask a blessing over us today as we finish. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come forward and um, we're going to actually end, we'll end our service now, but, we, but prayer will be open for the next couple of minutes. If you want prayer, if, if you, uh, have, the Lord's just doing a work in your life and you want to like ask for somebody to pray into that, if you have a need, We'd love to invite you to do that. We're going to have some music that continues to, to play. So you're welcome to do that after I uh, ask the Lord to bless us and give us a benediction. So why don't we stand and um, we'll receive the benediction of the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and give you his heart to care for the culture that he's sending you into. Give you his heart to see new things come to life. May he give you his faithful presence as he is faithfully present within you. May he send you as his image to bring about that new world. We love you, Jesus, and we trust you for these things. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.